Where is Tolani? <laughs> Tolani, your story is an amazing story. We are very glad that you are alive. If I had known that you'd play this clip, <laughs> I would have stayed outside <laughs> until you had finished. Because uh, very often when he plays, I do break down. But uh, I don't know why it should happen today because I thought that I had been able to overcome this. And I thought I had been able to succeed to do that because I decided to watch it uh, quite a few times. <laughs> and then after some time, I wasn't breaking down. So I think that I haven't seen it in a long time, and that's why. But uh, do for, forgive me. Uh, I understand that there are members of the Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises with us. I acknowledge them. I understand that there is a Mr. Carl Kosner, COO of Premedia Broadcasting. I acknowledged him. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to be with you and to share my story with you. I wish that I had had enough time to have been here much earlier and to hear other stories of other people as well. But I'm glad that I was able to hear what I consider to be Tolani's full story because uh, it's an amazing story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to talk a little bit about myself today. It is not something that I like doing, talking about myself, but I guess that today's occasion is different and requires that I should talk about myself for a good cause. I grew up in a village between High Flats and Itlopo in KZN called Emazabegweni. There were nine of us children in the family. And my mother raised us mostly single-handedly because My father, before he passed on, was working on the mines in Johannesburg. And like many men of the time who worked on the mines in Johannesburg, 
didn't come home sometimes for a number of years and sometimes or very often actually didn't send any money home for the wife and the children. And after my father had passed on, my father's brother took my mother over in terms of a custom called Ugungena in the Zulu culture, in terms of which if a woman loses her husband, a brother can take over the woman and the children and basically be her husband and be the father to the children. But that one too didn't look well after my mother and the children. And in the end, it is fair to say, for all intents and purposes, my mother raised all nine of us single-handedly. My life is not just my life. My life, to a very large extent, has to be told, my life story has to be told with special reference to two women and two men. The one woman was my mother, a special woman, an amazing woman, a resilient woman. She contributed immensely to the man that I am today. And the two men, one of them was a pastor, a Reverend John Boma, and maybe Klolani might know him, I'm not sure. He was principal of the school that I attended, but he might have left by the time Klolani came because, of course, Klolani is much younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> Father John Boma was the principal of the boarding school that I attended. It was a Roman Catholic school. It was a boys on the school. The other man is the one to whom I referred in the video clip. At the time of the interview, I thought he was uh, Mr. Musa because he, that's how he was known at the shop where I approached him but I actually discovered after the video clip and when, I, when he and I had a reunion that he was actually his Mr. Bucks. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, his shop was called Kwa Musa. So that's where the Musa comes from. <laughs> and if you entered his shop, you would be left in no doubt as who the boss was, who the owner was, because he was always standing there, most of the time wearing safari suits and checking that everybody was doing what they were doing. And um, you, you would always say, this must be the owner. So, uh, and if the shop is called Wa Musa, he must be Mr. Musa. <laughs> <laughs> so those, and then the fourth 
uh, the other the, 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 the second woman who played an important role in my life was uh, the late Mrs. Victoria Mklenge, with whom I served articles, but unfortunately couldn't finish my articles with her because she got assassinated before I could finish my articles of clerkship with her. That's the training to become an attorney. Those four people are very prominent in my life story for the roles that they played. But I think it's important to start at the beginning. And I think the beginning is the kind of life that the family had, that I had as I grew up as a young boy. Kolani was saying earlier on that somebody said, you are the man that you are because of the boy that you were. And I think that must be very true of me in terms of certain things. It might not be true in regard to certain other fishers. <coughs> one, of my, one of the names that my mother gave me when I was born was Mnyamezeli. Uh, Mnyamezeli, of course, for those who might not be Zulu speaking, means Persevera. And the other name I got was Mlungisi. And uh, that means somebody who puts things right, somebody who fixes things. And then, of course, I got the English one. And uh, for a long time, I didn't use the English one. I used uh, Mlungisi. But when I started articles with Mrs. Mklenge, and members of staff kept on using Lungisi to call me. She said, no, 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 no. This is not on. You're not going to be called Lungisi here. Uh, and then she said, you are Ray, from Raymond. And that, that was because Mlungisi was her husband's name. <laughs> and uh, her husband had been killed, as you all know, by apartheid uh, agents. And I understood when she said this to me because I thought it meant that Whenever anyone in the office called my name, she could be thinking of her husband because they had even been working in the same office as attorneys. So a lot of people that knew me before that time use Mlungisi and not Ray. And when people say Ray, I can kind of tell from when they got to know me. <laughs> But the, the life that we had as a family was a life that I think was typical of most households in the village in which I grew up. But our family would have been counted as one of the poorest in the village. You can imagine a woman who was raising nine children all by herself. She had not gone fine education. She went up to standard six, and she didn't have any qualification. At some stage, she had worked as, an, as what was called a nurse aide, but later on, she worked as a shop assistant in a general dealer in the same village. So she didn't earn much. 
but my mother was very passionate about education. When she worked as a nurse aide at a certain hospital, she had come across certain doctors who had studied at universities, and somehow she had been very impressed with them. And she preached the importance of education to all of us as her children. She said she wanted each and every one of us to get the best education that she could afford to give us. And when my elder sister wanted to leave school because she wanted to get married because her boyfriend was in a hurry to get married, she and my mom had a big fight because my mother said, you need education. This education that you need will help you even in your married life. And until she died, which was in 2015, my mother from time to time referred to that experience when my elder sister effectively defied her and went to get married when she was saying, continue with your school. But because of that experience with regard to my sister, she emphasized the importance of education to the rest of us even more. <coughs> the poverty that most households or many households in that village suffered which we suffered as well, was the kind of poverty that many people maybe really um, cannot even imagine. My mother would sometimes say there was too little food for all of us for dinner, and she would not have dinner so that we could have dinner. Sometimes she would tell us that she didn't know what we would have in the evening because there was no money and there was no milly meal, milly meal. There was nothing. And ultimately, maybe she would go to a neighbor and ask for something and we would have something. Those who know Oputu, I know those, yeah, some would know Oputu. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes we would have Oputu for morning as breakfast, lunch, and supper without anything, no curry, nothing. And sometimes there was no tea, because sometimes you could have it with tea. But sometimes it was so bad that we went to the extent that you would put salt on the plate, and then you would take oputu and dip it into salt and pretend that it is something nice <laughs> and eat. That just characterizes some of the fissures of the kind of poverty that many households in our village, including my own, went through. I think at a certain stage, a neighbor realized that most of the time I was wearing torn clothes and she called me and gave me three white shirts 
And I've never forgotten that because then I realized that it meant that even people, neighbors could see that there were challenges in terms of clothes for us. I'm happy that when I had qualified as a lawyer, I was able to go back to that neighbor, Umatreman Wagajidi, and thanked her appropriately. My mother didn't have chores for boys and chores for girls. Boys had to do also chores that normally would be done by girls. As a result, I know what it means to take a bucket, even as a boy, and go to the spring and fetch water and put the bucket on your head and bring water home. That's what we used to do. I know what it means to go and collect firewood and put it on your head as a boy and walk four kilometers, five kilometers home because the family needed to have firewood in order to be able to make, to cook. And at that time, the schools that we had were only primary schools that were in the area. And if you wanted to go further, you had to go far. At a certain stage, I had to go to school at Carisbrook. Those of you who may have read Alan Patton's book, Pride the Beloved Country, will remember a reference to Carisbrook. It's a school that is at Ikobo. I went to that school. I think that the minimum distance from my home to that school would have been about seven, eight kilometers. And we would walk to school in the morning and come back in the afternoon. And that would make a minimum of 14 kilometers uh, walking. And uh, at a certain stage, my mother said, no, you must stop because this is too much. This was now in winter when you had to walk such long distances. And of course, we didn't have shoes. And in winter, it could be very cold at Ikopo. And for that year, I didn't continue with school and waited because there was a word that the following year, there would be further classes in our local school. So I know how it, how it is to go those, walk those long distances to school. Arrive at school when you are tired. Walk back in the afternoon. Come home when it's almost dark. I know all of those things. Other children that used to attend the school, some of them had bicycles that they, could, uh, that they rode, which uh, we couldn't afford. But my mother was very passionate about education, and he had sent me to that school because he didn't want me to stay at home. But I think she realized after some time that it was too much for, I think at that stage, I was 13 years old. One of the important things in my life arises from the fact that I met Father John Bomer. That is when I went to boarding school. And my going to boarding school was like some kind of miracle because the boarding school was quite expensive by the standards of those times and certainly for my family. 
and certainly for my mother. But my mother wanted me to go to this boarding school because it provided good education. She couldn't buy me new pens that were required in terms of the rules of, this, of the school and had to ask her employers at the time if they could find some pens that their son, who was more or less my age, could spare us. She could only buy one pair of trousers for me, long, long trousers. It was khaki. They needed to be two gray pants, long pants. We could only get one second hand from her employer's son. And on the day that I went to school, to boarding school, my mother walked me to the bus stop. And I'll never forget some of the things she said to me as we walked to the bus stop. And I remember it was drizzling. And she was wearing a torn pinafore. And she was saying to me, my son, I'm sending you to school. You can see we are not going to have anything in the house. All the money I've given to you to pay at school. But we will see what we can do. God will make a plan. That's what she said. God will make a plan. But when you are at school, please don't pay attention to how beautiful the other learners are dressed. Don't look at what you are wearing. Focus on your books. Focus on your education. And that's what I try to do. And um, I think I did successfully. And then something happened during the time that I was at boarding school, which should not have happened. I, like some of the boys my age at the time, became naughty. And I, I got a girl pregnant. And during those times, if you did that in the village, Parents would tell you to stop schooling because you think now you are a man. You must go and work. So I remember I had to ask for special permission at school to go home without disclosing the true reason why I needed to go home. Because if I had disclosed it, I would have been expelled from school as well. And I was expecting that my mom would be so angry that she might say, you're not going back to school. You have disappointed me. I came and explained everything. I apologized to her, and she accepted my apology. And she scolded me for doing this, but she said, OK, go, go back to school. Focus on your books and I will deal with the family of the girl because you have got to pay damages according to our culture. And uh, where was the money going to come from to pay those damages? So I went back to school. That is one of the most important things that my mom did for me. Not to say I must come out of school. Because if she had said, I would have understood in terms of what was being done in the village where I grew up. And if that had happened, I may never have continued with my education. But she had confidence in me that I would still be able to focus on education <coughs> and move forward. <coughs> and that is what happened. Father John Boma arranged bursaries for me because she or he could see that I was from a poor 
family. And I got bursaries that took me up to matric. And close to matric, he gave me an address to write to another bursary fund that would uh, pay for university. And uh, I applied, and they said, when you have passed your metric and you have got the right pass, let us know. So that is why in that video clip, I was saying I was quite confident that I would pass quite well in metric. I was quite confident that I would get a bursary. And that should enable me to go to university and do law, which is what I was very passionate about. But the problem was simply that the expectation within the community was that now that I had gone that far, I would go and look for a job and work and help my mother and my siblings. And if I went to university, they would view me as very selfish. And when I discussed with my mother this dilemma that I was facing, her response was profound. She said, my son, go to university. Don't worry about us. God will make a plan. She used to say, God doesn't close the door without opening a window. God will always make a plan. So for most of the time, she didn't worry about this dilemma that um, I was worried about. She was saying, go to university. But I felt that I, am, I would not feel at ease in my conscience if I left my family uh, and went to university in circumstances where I knew there was really nothing, nobody working, my mother's savings had been exhausted, and uh, um, her uh, business of knitting jerseys and selling them had failed. But then, of course, Mr. Bucks, as you heard, came through. <laughs> I thought it was Mr. Musa. He came through. And um, I will forever be grateful to him. Subsequently, I went to the university. During holidays, university vacations, I would uh, find jobs. And I would use the money that I would get when I did my vacation jobs to pay for the school fees of my younger siblings at school and to buy them clothes and to buy myself clothes too because the bursary wasn't going to buy clothes for me, so I had to do that. So I would work during vacations and use that money to make sure that my siblings also went to school, got clothing, and that I got clothing too. And of course, when I finished my first degree and went back to Mr. Bucks, he, wouldn't, uh, he didn't want to, me to repay, and he wanted me to do for others what he had done for me. And uh, I will never forget those words. This was somebody who had made sure that for three years my family had food on the table. He had not known me before I approached him. He didn't ask for any ID, didn't make me sign anything. And even in between, the time that I was doing my junior degree, when I came to update him about what was happening to me, he wasn't somebody that seemed to want me to appreciate that he was doing quite a lot for me. It was like, okay, no, please carry on, study, work hard. But that was about all. So, and when I had finished, that's all he said. <coughs> and as I said in the video clip, I try to make sure that I honor that. Because had certain people not extended help to me, 
I also wouldn't be where I am. And then when I had to do my articles of clerkship to train as an attorney, I had to ask Ms. Mklenge if I could at the same time register for my LLB at the University of Natal, UKZN now. So I wanted to do both. And uh, she agreed. So I was registered at the university and also doing articles. So when at the university I had three or so free lectures, I would go to the office and work and then just try and come back in time for the next lecture that I had to attend. I bought a small motorbike to help me. And um, I would take work from the office, files that I needed to work on, take them to university because I was staying inside on, uh, at the residence. And then in the evening, I would do the office work and then do my assignments and my other school work. And that's what I did until I finished my LLB. And I'm grateful to Mrs. Nklenge for having allowed me to do that because I think that uh, uh, it might not have been easy for someone else to agree that a candidate attorney should do that. But I'm more grateful to Mrs. Nklenge for the confidence that she showed in me when she allowed me, uh, when she asked me to in effect open a labor law department in her office. As an article clerk, she gave me a big office, she gave me a secretary, and she said, this is where you will consult. That was because I'd spent some time at the Legal Resources Center where they used to do labor, labor, labor law work. And she had a lot of that work, but said to me, in this firm, we don't know this new thing called labor law. So you are going to help us. And uh, she gave me a lot of support. And that helped me quite a lot. And I think she deserves a lot of credit for the lawyer that I ultimately became. Well, just to go back to the video clip, after it had gone viral last year, I got a, a, a letter from a bank, uh, Al Baraka Bank, they showed appreciation for what Mr. Bax had done and, my old, and what I had also done in going back to him to thank him and offering to pay. And they invited us and our families for a dinner to honor us. And we agreed and went there. But on the day that we went there, on the evening that we went there, they said they also actually had an idea that what started in, when I had needed to go to university should not end without anything that would ensure that others got helped. They suggested that a trust be established which would help students from rural areas, because I was from a rural area, which would help students. It would raise funds and help them with tertiary education in memory of this cooperation between myself and Mr. Bax. And we agreed, and this was announced at that dinner. The bank, the bank CEO 
said that the bank was pledging the first 20,000 rand, and within 15 minutes, a number of people who were present at the dinner had pledged more than 200,000 rand. The, the trust has been established. It is named after me and Mr. Bax. It's a Zondo Bax uh, Trust. <laughs> <laughs> and I recently saw that it has, I think, more than 280,000 rand in, in its account now. Next year, it will start to uh, assist st rural students who need to go to university. And uh, there is a board of trustees that's, in, that's involved. And it hopes to raise more funds to help students uh, from rural areas to get higher education. I'm very grateful for, to them for, having, for them having started that. I think it is wonderful. But I also think I mustn't end this talk without making a reference to another trust. When I was nominated for the position of Deputy Chief Justice, I got a lot of support from various people and organizations for which I was and remain very grateful. But the one letter of support that moved me immensely was a letter from an association of women judges in South Africa who wrote to the Judicial Service Commission and motivated very strongly that I should be appointed the Deputy Chief Justice. And in their letter, they pointed out how they said I had helped give opportunities to a lot of women when I was judge president of the Labor Appeal Court and Labor Court, and felt that uh, uh, for that I should get support. Arising out of that, <laughs> arising out of that, they invited me to their AGM last year, and in my talk, I said to them, I had previously urged the Black Lawyers Association to establish a trust or a fund to help black lawyers and women lawyers uh, get exposure to various branches of law and to assist them. And BLA had not been able to do that. So I said to them, if you are able to take this challenge, I'll take the money that I would have given them and give it to you. Uh, I had pledged to give BLA 20, the first 20,000 rand if they did that. So I said, if you come up with the trust first, then I'll give you that 20,000 rand. And they have now established a trust and uh, soon it will be registered and it's going to help a lot of women lawyers. I think I have been speaking for a long time. <laughs> but I just take this opportunity to thank the organizers once again for inviting me here to share my story with you. I hope that there are some who will be motivated by it to do what is right, to help others, but also to persevere in difficult times. Because when I look back at the type of village I, I come from 
at the type of household that I come from. It's like a miracle that I am where I am in life. But I acknowledge all the time that I'm not where I am in life just because of myself. I am where I am because there are so many women and men who have helped me in life, who have extended a hand, who have extended help, who have given moral support to make sure that I could be what I wanted to be. And I appreciate it. And I think we must all do the best we can to help others and to give them a chance to accomplish what they are passionate about. Thank you very much.